Hi, welcome everyone to uh, the fam to today's Family History Today program. Um, this is one of the Center for Jewish, Jewish History's monthly series of genealogy themed public programs. Uh, I um, give a special welcome to anyone joining from Israel today. Um, as we are not normally, um, we don't no normally host programs at times that are uh, reasonable for people watching from Israel. So I'm glad you are able to join us today. My name is Moria Amit and I'm the Center's Senior Genealogy Librarian. At the Center for Jewish History, we provide a collaborative home for five partner organizations that together form the largest archive on the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel. In addition, the Center houses the Ackman and Ziff Family Genealogy Institute, which strives to connect researchers to the wealth of genealogy resources at the Center and to make family history accessible to people of all ages, levels of ability, uh, and levels of experience, whether Jewish or non-Jewish. The Genealogy Institute is open. Uh, we're currently open from Tuesday through, uh, sorry, from Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. At the Institute, you will enjoy access to genealogy databases and reference books with our librarians on hand to provide guidance. While we welcome walk-ins based on availability, we still recommend that you book an appointment at least one day before your visit. And you can do so at libraryservices.cjh.org. If you're unable to visit in person, you may schedule a free 45 minute Zoom consultation with one of our genealogy librarians or email us to ask for advice on your research questions by writing to us at gi at cjh.org. In addition, you may continue to engage with us online in the following ways. Watch our genealogy coffee break videos for brief tutorials on various topics on the Center for Jewish History's Facebook page or YouTube channel. There are over 60 videos available now and we continue to add a new one each month. And finally, check out the Center's program calendar at programs.cjh.org to find and register for future programs in our Family History Today series. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Please send us your questions and comments anytime during this program by using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please note, however, that our speaker will be uh, answering your questions during the dedicated Q&A period at the end of the presentation. This program features live captions, which have been made possible through the Institute for Museum and Library Services. If you'd like to view the captions for this program, click on the closed caption or CC button on the bottom of your screen and then click show subtitles. Finally, this program is being recorded. So in two to three weeks, you will be able to watch this video on the Center's YouTube channel. Uh, so please stay tuned to that. Uh, okay, so now on to today's program. I would, I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rina Offenbach, today's speaker. Uh, since 2010, Rina has been the director of the BINTV Ha'apala Information and Research Center at the Alp League Detention Camp. Rina is also a tour guide for English and German speaking groups licensed by the Israeli Ministry of Tourism. She received a master's degree in studies of the land of Israel from Haifa University. So I thank uh, Rina for joining us today and putting together this special presentation. Um, Rina, you're welcome to turn your camera and mic on at this point. Oh, Hi. There you are. Uh, one second, I will. Thank you. There we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Oh. For me, it's a good evening for you. It's um, good morning or good lunch uh, time. And um, I'm really excited to be here uh, with you. As um, I wanted to tell you that uh, my first uh, researches and investigations on genealogy started really in New York in the early 90s as I was um, trying to trace roots of a family, a Jewish family 
named Katz, which makes everything much more complicated, who immigrated to Israel in the first uh, Aliyah, 1882, and later on went and spread around the world and um, arrived in New York sometimes in the, uh, I think it was the 50s or 60s. And so um, I really learned a lot by this research in New York. Uh, it, there was no internet yet, and I was sitting uh, many days in the public library on Forty uh, Second uh, Street, and there was a um, department of genealogy, and I got a lot of help, and I learned a lot. And um, yeah, since then we have uh, uh, achieved a lot of um, progress in this subject, and also I think that uh, many more people are interested in genealogy and all the uh, computerizing um, is helping us, of course. And uh, in that way, we can uh, reach uh, much more information and much, uh, much uh, faster in a rapid way instead of uh, traveling to New York, living on a, French, uh, a friend's uh, sofa in the living room and going to the public library every day. Um, so this is the aim of what we do here in Atleet, is to offer a very uh, fast and quick access to genealogists and also to document our subject, which is the illegal immigrants during the mandate period. So I wanted to say just uh, two words about uh, my uh, roots, my background. I was born to um, my mother, who was born here in Palestine in 1929. Her grandparents came um, during the Ottoman uh, regime still. My father, uh, on the other hand, was born in Poland. And in 1935, as a young boy, he was just after his bar mitzvahs, I think. Uh, came with his mother and his brother and immigrated legally to Israel. Uh, they went to kibbutz and um, just as I was thinking about this lecture, um, I realized that, you know, uh, after living in, in a small shtetl in Poland, and suddenly to be in the fields of Jezreel Valley in Israel, it's a very, very big change. And he became very Israeli. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that also because of, of the year 1935. 1935 uh, was a very big year of legal immigration to Israel, not just 35, but let's say all the period of the fourth uh, high commissioner, the British high commissioner to uh, Palestine, uh, Sir Wokop, uh, his name was, who uh, was, uh, as we like to say in, in Hebrew, I don't know how you say it in English, was good to the Jews. And he uh, gave, um, at that time, there was uh, really um, some, some five, six years of about 220,000 legal immigrants who were coming to Israel from um, Europe and other countries. And that's why I mentioned the date, the, the year of my father's uh, Aliyah immigration, because it was during that time exactly. Uh, what brought later on uh, what we call the Arab rebel or the, the Arab rebel against the, the British because of all these big numbers of immigrants who came legally to the country. At the end, uh, the British also replaced Sir Arthur Wokop, who is another um, uh, high commissioner. And as you know, um, well, I don't know, I hope you see, but I'm, I'm holding here a book that I bought once as a young woman in a second uh, hand uh, bookshop. And you see, this is actually the report that was uh, written by the committee of McDonald that was sent to Palestine uh, in 1936 when this rebel started because of all the quantities of immigrants. 
And um, they are giving here a report um, and later on brought, this report brought to uh, what we call the white book of 1939 of McDonald. Yeah. Now, it's interesting to see that uh, the British are operating in one way, and it's regardless to what goes on in Europe at the time, yeah? 35, Hitler was already in power. 30, 35, the Nuremberg uh, uh, laws. Uh, 37, 38, people already, the Jews, some Jews are already going into uh, concentration camps in Buchenwald, Sachsenhausen and others. Yeah, so there's like, uh, um, a blockage of the British to on the immigration and the illegal immigration, of course, that was formed because of the, uh, the, the very low quota of immigration that uh, they have allowed, the British have allowed. And, um, and uh, what is going on on the other side, that is uh, a very, very big need of uh, Jews to uh, leave Europe and not just Europe, also other places around the world. And at that point, I would say that we are documenting all illegals, not just Europeans. So I'd like to uh, share my, uh, my, um, right. What I've prepared for this, Lecture, just a second. Do you see it? Why don't I have uh, it? Rina? It yeah, is. I'm trying, trying yeah. to. Yeah, oh. just click on slideshow. There you go. Yeah, so here we are. That's the first uh, uh, screen, and uh, we just collaborated here some pictures. Um, um, to explain that we are not dealing just with ships, as you see on the uh, the top right, but also illegal immigration by foot or by trucks, especially if they come from neighboring countries like uh, Iraq or Iran or from Syria, Lebanon, and so. This is in the center here, and even by plane. This is. Um, 1947 from Iraq and from Italy, illegal plane. Okay, that uh, was an American plane from uh, war uh, Air Force, American Air Force, uh, run by two one pilot and one navigator, two American guys uh, that helped the Ali Abed, the clandestine immigration. Okay, so. I just wanted to show you uh, where Atlit situated. I'm sorry that for the e Hebrew, yeah, but um, if you see, this is the uh, Haifa Bay. Uh, Haifa, the town Haifa is on the Carmel Mountain. And just down here, about um, uh, six miles down south from Haifa, is the area of Atlit. Um, it's a small community that was a uh, small village that the settlement that was settled here in 1903 or so. Now the British were holding all that area around Haifa from Atlit all the way up to um, south of Akko as their military area with a lot of camps, Haifa port and so on and so forth. They situated the camp of Atlit here. So I'm sitting here right now in the office and there you know where we are. Sorry, okay. I cut down um, two um, uh, pieces from the, the report that I've shown you. Yeah, and um, this is how to, to, to show what really made the British make the quota of the immigration. It doesn't show all the elements, yeah, but if you look here, um, loyalty to the mandate is appeared, required that the Jewish immigration should continue as long as it could be shown that it did not injure Arab economic interests. Okay, they didn't want to have uh, numbers of welfare, uh, people, Jewish people taking jobs from Arabs, 
uh, changing the balance of the economy, okay? And um, so on and so forth. The question was not really only economical. Sorry, Rina, one second. Yeah. I think you need to advance to the next slide. Yeah, why? We're still seeing the map. Oh, and now? Uh, no. Okay, so I will make a new share again. Okay. And um, do you see it now? No, it's still on the map. Hmm. hmm. Oh, and now I've lost it. I have to look for it again. Just a second. Okay, no problem. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Um, what should I do? Do you have the uh, slideshow on your desktop? I do. Okay. Let's see now. Well, now you're on the website. There you go. Okay. okay. Yeah, from here. That's perfect. There we go. Okay, so I'll try to go a little bit faster, right? Uh, this is what is really the most important sentence here the uh, criteria of the criterion of economic absorptive capacity. This is what led the British allowing Jewish immigration, okay? They have uh, built some capacity uh, to this land. Let's say uh, what they write in their report is that uh, in Israel, in Palestine, the maximum people who can live on that land can, is only one and a half million people. Okay, if you reach one and a half million people, then you will have not enough land, agriculture, water, and so on and so forth. So they, what they could allow is just according to the development of the economy and the development of the land and how much it can absorb in its capacity. Okay, so that's a very, that's actually what led all the uh, allowance of immigration okay it says here in other words immigration is to be uh, facilitated but its flow must be controlled okay sub controlled by the application of the regulation principle of economic absorptive capacity that's a very important uh, uh, sentence here okay and uh, think about it now that we are nine million uh, people here in this land. Okay, um, you understand already and that that's clear, yeah? Although sometimes it's even not clear here in Israel, who is an illegal immigrant and who is immigrant, Ole. Okay, now we are using the word uh, illegal because this is what the British used, but I know that in other countries and in many other cases, we would say clandestine immigration because it was done in, um, you know, under the radar and so, uh, but the British really call it illegal immigration or illegal immigrant. So uh, legal immigrant, he would get his uh, certificate to immigrate to Israel, to Palestine, sorry, uh, by the government of Palestine, by the uh, uh, immigration office, and according to the immigration ordinance, ordinance of um, there was one in 1922, and then in 1932, and then in 41, all the time they were um, um, writing down a, a new ordinance. Ordinance, and uh, you will get the this stamp in your passport if you wanted to stay. This is uh, somebody gave it to us, this passport who was uh, detained here in Atlit, even though there were legal immigrants who came, this guy, for instance, he came in 1944, 
they were detained in Atlit. So around the end of the world, Second World War, people who immigrated were also in Atlit camp and we also document them. Um, on the contrary, uh, we see here um, a document that is written certificate, but this is all false. This belongs to a, a guy who was on the Exodus that has no name on it, just a number. And this was done by the Exodus illegal immigrants themselves. So, okay, you see they would write policies for deportation. Now, I, I'm showing you this uh, folder from the uh, State Archive in Israel because the idea was to deport the illegal immigrants, um, not to hold them here. I'm, we are sitting in a detention camp, but the idea was not to detain them. The idea was to deport them. And in this policy, what they write is that it, the best way to deport people would be in within 24 hours, that they will not have time to appeal to any court for any reason to stay or to, and they are giving uh, all kinds of examples of how, for instance, somebody who came here illegally is asking a friend of him, of his to, uh, to apply to go to court against him uh, for, um, you know, uh, money that he owes him or something like that. Once you go into court for any reason, then you get, uh, you stay here and you stay longer. And then the more you apply, uh, the longer you stay, and then it will be difficult to deport you. So the idea of the British, this is, by the way, this policy is from 1932, even before the uh, organized uh, illegal immigration who started the, that started in 1934, okay, to deport. So I jump very fast to 1939. I just said that in 34, the illegal organized immigration started because the mandate is here already in 1920, okay, 1921. And Jews are trying to come in illegally, but it's not organized. They, there's like, let's say two friends, three friends going or a family going to Beirut on a boat and they land in the port and then they are uh, looking for some smuggler from the area and they go by foot and they cross the border. And so this is not, a, it is organized, but not organized for big groups. So 1934, um, it's the, the first ship arrived from Romania with a group that got organized in order to come here illegally together. And uh, this uh, boat called Velos and they uh, succeed, succeed and there's uh, some 300 or so Ill illegal immigrants who land on a shore and get into the country. And uh, as the situation of Jews in Europe um, becomes more and more complicated, especially after 1938, but not only there, also for Polish young people, you remember that we the, the, the quota of the immigration certificates is given if the Jews, the legal, the immigrants are not injuring any economic situation of the Arabs. So imagine that uh, suddenly 200, 500, 1000 young men will come and they will want to work. They don't have family to support them. They don't have a thousand lira um, <clears throat> yeah, sterling to support them. So they have to work. So this is already um, difficult to get a certificate if you are young men from Hachshara, from Chalutz, from a kibbutz group that want to settle here. Okay, and they get very, very few certificates. I'm talking about all these uh, halutzim, yeah, the pioneers with the ideology of building kibbutz and being socialist, they don't get, they hardly get any, yeah. Think about the revisionists, who is giving the 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 uh, lists of immigrants? It's the Jewish Agency, which is has different ideology from the revisionists of uh, Jabotinsky, so they get also less. Um, certificates. Okay, so these groups who are on the margins 
and who are, don't fit into the economic, uh, economic picture of the British would try to come here illegally. Okay, so there's different groups. Uh, for instance, the group of the uh, boat Simi, these are Halutzim, pioneers, three groups of pioneers who get together, they uh, collect money, they um, get uh, someone to um, make relationship with um, a boat holder from uh, Greece. This guy, Pandelis, his name is Jean Pandelis, he was working a lot with the Ali Abet, with the illegal immigration, also before the war, after the war, and they get a boat to go to uh, Palestine. There's some, uh, we don't know exa the exact number on that boat because it, it had such a, uh, such a fate that boat uh, that it's hard to tell how many people was, were on it, okay? But um, as they come close uh, to Natania, to the shores, Natania, you know, it's a little bit uh, up uh, north of Tel Aviv. They managed to let 90 people down on the shore and then they must run away. Remember that the captain, it's, it's a Greek boat and the captain is Greek and all the team is Greek. But always all the ships of illegal immigration had um, a crew was all, you know, just getting paid or if they volunteered like some Italians or Spanish people after the war who volunteered or American uh, jury who volunteered, yeah. But um, the professional crew would get paid and uh, they didn't want to get caught because they would just lose their um, profession, they would lose their boats. And um, uh, this is another way of the British to um, stop illegal, illegal immigration to, um, to make it uh, very difficult to the uh, foreign crew. So, um, uh, the captain did not want to come back. So they are going into the sea and some small boats from uh, the, Is the Israelis are going into the sea out of the territorial water. They are going on the boat of a Simi and they catch the captain and they uh, tie him to some in, some in some small room and get another 140. And so this Simi is going all the time to the shore, back from outside the shore. In the end, the British catch them, okay? And they bring them to Haifa and um, uh, they put more immigrants on the ship that were caught before and now they're going to be deported. And there's a lot of demonstration everywhere in Israel against the deportation. Sorry, all the time I say Israel, it's just uh, you know natural for me to think that I'm in Israel. So I have to jump back to the time and say Palestine. And um, nothing helps and they are being deported and no food, no water, nothing is being loaded to the boat and the boat just leave the Haifa uh, Bay and start heading back to Greece. They come to Greece and they uh, spend another two months in a, on an island in Greece. And there they uh, manage to um, get a, um, a sailing boat and they tie the sailing boat to the Sasimi and they go back already. It's almost three months since they started leaving uh, Constanza. Uh, going to Israel, to Palestine, going back to Greece, and so on and so forth. And this uh, sailing boat, as they come to the territorial water of, of Palestine, they are moving from, this was a very uh, regular and normal trip that they've done because they, uh, they could not let the captains lose their boats because the British would just... Um, confiscate them, will not, you, we would have to pay a lot of money for that. The captains would go to, to jail in Akko, which was uh, very difficult to be there. And uh, you didn't want, nobody wanted to lose the crews. Uh, and they, you needed the crew, the professional crew. And so they would um, tow behind them small boats. And as they come close to the territorial water, they would move, uh, transfer the people from the, the main boat to the small boat 
and just let the small boat go towards the shore. And so the people of Usimi were caught. And what you see, we are talking now about, about I don't know, 6 uh, June, June 1939. Yeah, and what you see here is one of the, um, there's lots of them in the state archive in Israel from the police department uh, of the British. And I show you this, this, this guy, is, he's from a Simi, Salomon Meisels. And what he says here, the place of birth, he says, I, I was born in Hamburg in Germany, which is not true because all these people, they were from Poland, but at that time, already June, just before the begin, beginning of the Second uh, uh, World War, you didn't have papers, they didn't have any documents on them, they threw all the documents away, they could say whatever they wanted to say, and if they say they are from Germany, they would not be sent back, okay, they would be staying here, and they would be detained until deportation, nobody knew that they, uh, <laughs> In the end, they will not be deported because of the war. But uh, if they would say Poland, the British would deport them even then in June 1939. So I show you one uh, order of deportation after, first of all, yeah, this is an application for an order because the police, the Palestine police force is asking for an application from the uh, immigration officer. And then the immigration officer is giving a, an order of deportation, and you see when in October 1942. Even then, there was so difficult trying to deport people during the war. This is from a boat called Darian Darian Two. Okay. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. It's uh, just to show you here that the the uh, recommendation of McDonald, which became the the white paper is to allow 12,000 um, a month, okay? And we are now at the beginning of the Second World War. Okay, um, yeah, so any person is refused permission to enter Palestine tempor temporarily can be detained in such a manner and so on and so forth. And in the beginning, they detained the people in different uh, army bases of the British uh, military, and also in Haifa Bay in the quarantine. But as the waves of immigration grow, then they decide to build Atli detention camp. This was in August 1939. Very soon after two months, you have a camp already. Um, and here you see, <clears throat> the first um, part of the detention camp, because after the Second World War, the detention camp was much bigger and it had an extension here because of the numbers of ref refugees, illegal refugees, illegal immigrants who were coming after the war. So this is from 1939. And you see the barracks, you see the Carmel Mountain, you see all the fields in between today, the old bananas fields. But uh, the British had camps here. They had a big jail here. They had a labor camp. They had a Royal Air Force, uh, Air Force camp and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, right. I wanted to share with you one of the uh, investigations that we made here. Uh, we were planning to give a, a lecture about a boat that was called the Hamaapila uh, Almoni, the anonymous uh, illegal immigrant, uh, for the people, for the families who whose parents uh, or themselves were on that boat. So we started with this woman and that story of a family, the family of uh, Lazal. Sorry, there's an H missing here. Uh, we'll show you what happened before the war and after the war. So. The family Lazar was living in Vienna. Uh, there's the Margaret mother. She has two children. She has a, a son called Herbert and a, a daughter called Ruth. And um, she has a sister who marries uh, a British soldier and immigrates to England uh, in order to save her life. Um, this happens before. Uh, the, 
the Second World War. We are 1939. Uh, I don't know exactly which months, but the two, two children are going to England. And she, she's about 50 and she wants to save her life and she is trying to get a, a passport. You see, people in, in the past did not travel very much and so they didn't hold passports. So they had to go to an office that was opened in Vienna by Adolf Eichmann is the office for the immigration or the emigration of the Jews out of the Third Reich. And they get these passports for emigration only with the uh, Reich's uh, stamps. This is, this is uh, from someone else because we don't have Margarete Lazar passport. So, okay, this guy, uh, his name is Bertolt Stolfer. He was the operator of Eichmann's in organizing the uh, transfers of the Jews from Vienna, but not only from all the Third Reich. Um, he started that after the Alia Betz organized trans uh, transports, but uh, Eichmann nominated him to be and he actually, that guy, who is less known in the, um, you know, in the under the names of, of people who saved lives, he is less known. And but he saved about nine thousand people, a little bit more, nine thousand four hundred Jews, who were transported by him to other countries, especially to Portugal and Spain. One one a, a, a transport that he organized to illegal transport to Palestine was formed by uh, three boats. I'm showing this because this was a, this is in, in Bratislava. This is an area where it's a, it's a place where they all gathered from Danzig, from, from Gdansk, from Vienna, from Berlin, from, okay, to join his transport. Uh, how would you go on an illegal transport from Central Europe towards uh, uh, the, the, the Mediterranean Sea, the way was to sail along the Danube River. Danube River, uh, along the Danube River, there's many other countries, many countries, Hungary, um, Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, all of them should give you transit uh, uh, visas. Okay, so first you have to collect all the trans transit visas for these countries. This is an example from one of these um, a, a, a passports. Okay, um, at that time, when what we saw here is from 1940, 1941, when people traveling down the Danube in order to get to the, you see here, October 1940, the war is already on. People are still living uh, li under the uh, uh, the work of uh, Adolf Eichmann in Vienna. They are living. That's before he changed his uh, occupation there by the uh, German Reich. But this this was the first job that he had. So people are living, and at the same time, athlete camp is operating. Okay. So the people who are, the immigrants who are arriving, they are normally caught by the British and they are brought here. Okay, so we were talking about Margaret Lazar. Margaret Lazar goes on one of the three boats that are all leaving at the same time from a place called Tulcea. It's the Danube uh, 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 um, exit to the Black Sea, the delta of the Danube. So I show you a few pictures from the boat she was on. Uh, the name was Atlantic. You see old women here. She herself was about 50 years old. This old guy. Yeah, these are Jews really uh, fleeing from Europe, from, from Central Europe at the first year of the war. It's uh, now October 1940, the end of October 1940. And this is on the Atlantic. The, the, the boat's name is called Atlantic. What happens here is that the, the crew does not want to go to, to Palestine. So they throw all the, the coal 
into the sea and uh, the immigrants, the illegal immigrants are holding the crew. They take uh, control over the boat and they are starting to burn every piece of wood that they can uh, to continue with their voyage. So this is what we see here. What happens later is that all these three boats are being caught and they are to be deported to Mauritius. This is in November 1940, the end of November 1940. Uh, the deportation boat was called Patria and Patria was blown up in Haifa port by the Haganah in order to stop them, stop the British from taking them to Mauritius. There was a big disaster. Some 10% of the immigrants who were on Patria uh, drowned in the sea inside the port. It was a big disaster. But the people who were on Atlantic, they were really deported to Mauritius. Some 1,800 people, among them Margareta Lazar. And you see here the big jail in uh, Bobasan in Mauritius, where they were detained for almost five years. This is the main detention, and this is the female detention, and not just that, also the uh, clinic where the people who were sick with malaria was um, uh, lying down being sick yeah because uh, it's a tropical island and thinking about them coming from berlin vienna and so on and so forth so margareta lazar she is five years in detention in mauritius and this is almost the end of the second world war actually when they are f f uh, released from mauritius all these 1700 people there's about a hundred who joined the british army during the 1942 so and there's one 124 people who died in mauritius from different uh, diseases and so and buried there um they are coming back to to palestine in august 1945 at that time you remember she has two children one of them herbert is uh leaving london he was in london all the time in a Hachshara, Hachshara vibration group uh, to come to a kibbutz and they go illegally to, to France. Uh, he stays about a year and a half in France and then this group joins a boat called La Negev. La Negev means to the Negev, to, to the city of Israel. So we have a picture here of La Negev. It's a different, uh, different group of people um, of image immigrants, of illegal immigrants, not like the one we saw on the Atlantic there, there were older people from Germany, and so here we see a lot of people who survived the camps in the Negev. The Negev leaves France in February 1947, a year and a half after Margaret Lazar came to Israel, to Palestine. And what happens is that as they come to the shores of a Palestine, there is a battle between the uh, British and the illegal immigrants, and they beat them with uh, sticks. I forgot the name of these sticks that the policemen have. And one of the immigrants is being killed, and he's taken to Haifa. The immigrants are taken to Cyprus. I'm talking about February or the beginning of March 1947. Okay, later on, it's been uh, learned that this the, the the immigrant who died is Herbert Lazar, the son of Margareta. Margareta is already in England. She never found him because she wanted to go to meet her children, but he was in France. So when she arrived there after five years in Mauritius, she did not see him. She did not meet him. He was already on his way to Palestine, and he gets killed, and nobody knew his name because. Uh, all the other friends of his were taken to Mauritius, to, sorry, to Cyprus, to detention. So only a day, two days after, his name is being known. Okay, so uh, in every paper, it was written that the um, unnamed 
illegal immigrant, the one who was not, uh, um, that who, who was anonymous, yeah, now we know who he is, and his name is uh, Herbert Lazar, and he is buried in Haifa, that's, that's his picture, that's his tombstone in Haifa. Uh, in the beginning, it was, his name was not on the tombstone, as he was buried that night after he died, while his friends were going to Cyprus, he was buried as the anonymous illegal immigrant. And a ma uh, about a week after his boat left France, the boat Le Negev left, then another boat that was called the anonymous illeg illegal immigrant after his name, okay? So I was saying that we made uh, a lecture here about that boat, about him, we started tried to search and research who he was, his fate, his uh, life uh, story, and we found something very interesting. Look, we found out that uh, the sister of Herbert Wood, yeah, who lived in England, she married uh, an Englishman and they, in the late 50s, they immigrated to New Zealand. And there she had three children and her oldest son, became the uh, prime minister of New Zealand uh, for about eight years. The one, the former one before the prime minister of today. So, um, you know, this was a very exciting uh, finding, yeah? To know that the uh, grandson of Margaret Lazar, who was uh, detained in Mauritius and lost her son in, on the boat Le Negev uh, seven years after she was detained, is the Prime Minister of New Zealand. We wrote to his sister and we tried to interest her in giving us a, a testimony and so, but she only said thank you and she didn't want to continue the contact, but we were very happy to, you know, once you research, you find things, that's the thing. So this is a picture from our database here of all our files that we are uh, giving uh, questionnaires by families or by uh, illegal immigrants themselves. We started around 2000 and no, before, before 2000, uh, this center was uh, established because the camp itself became uh, a national site in 18, 1987, it became a national site. It was renovated, it was uh, uh, reconstructed. Uh, some, of, some of the um, barracks were reconstructed and immigrants started to come, illegal immigrants and gave us testimonies. And um, uh, the way we work is to have the Mapilis or Mapila is illegal immigrant or clandestine immigrant. He is always the center. And we want to build a cluster uh, that will hold any information that we can have, either by received from himself or by the family or other testimonies or memories, bi biographies, media, uh, whatever we can collect. And we do it slowly, slowly. Each time we collect more information about Mapil, about the personal guy or uh, uh, Mapila, the illegal immigrant, uh, female immigrant, and we build that cluster. We enlarge, we are deepening the information. So uh, if we do it from archives in Israel, we've got a list here of these, of the archives. Uh, some of you, you may know. Now, some of the archives, like Israel State Archive, when we started to document uh, information from them, they were not online yet, but now they're online. And we are building links from the information of uh, a MAPIL directly to the State Archive, to the pages, to the paper, or to the document where he is listed. Yad Vashem also is online. The Jewish Agency Central Zionist Archive is not online. So uh, we cannot show the information, but we can uh, write the reference and one can find the uh, information according to the reference that we've built and so on and so forth. So in fact, only, only the State Archive uh, and Yad Vashem have information online. Also this archive, Kiddush Hashem, 
in Bnei Brak. Um, okay. Uh, I show you one inform like what we do. We've got a very easy lists. Like before we saw the application uh, for an order of deportation, it's a uh, uh, typed by a typewriter, so it's easy to read. Uh, but we have uh, information like this, for instance, from the Israeli National Library, um, the book, a uh, few books uh, written by the uh, Committee of Rabbis in Cyprus camps about uh, marriages, uh, witnesses to, to uh, brides and grooms, uh, birth, uh, sometimes death, yeah? And um, if in order to access information from such a, a texts, we need uh, to know a little bit Yiddish, to be able to read uh, texts that are written in an, a way that is it's not a more than Hebrew. You see, it's a Hebrew letters, but it's a, the way that the rabbis would write uh, in a religious way and also in very, uh, I don't know if it's, it's not ancient Hebrew, but it's something that if we want to have help from uh, young volunteers, they will have problems reading that. Uh, and also to understand what they write here in Latin letters, but it's in the end, not that terrible. After some work, we can see who is the bride, who is the groom, who is the witness, and when did they marry, uh, what camp in Cyprus they were on. There were 12 uh, camps in Cyprus in what barrack, B34, date of birth. And so, so there's a lot of information in such pages. And we have six, uh, six notebooks like that, that holds about, uh, each one has 800 marriages. So it's like 2,400 marriages, maybe. 5,000 illegal immigrants, uh, including the witnesses. So it could be 10,000 people that we could uh, uh, retrieve information about. Uh, outside of Israel, there's uh, also a lot of archives. And um, one thing that I always say is that remember that there's always a point of uh, leaving uh, a port and uh, and transport, right? Uh, embarkation, embarkation. So there would be information in archives uh, where they left, the illegal immigrants left. For instance, I found uh, in Netherlands, I found in the state archive, lists of people who left, left Netherlands illegally in, in 1938 and so on and so forth. Now the, the the most in interesting information comes from the um, JDC and ITS. Uh, ITS, uh, it's not called ITS anymore. It's the Aulsen archives in Germany, uh, especially information about illegal immigrants before they started their illegal immigration, especially from UNRWA. Uh, UNRWA was uh, making a uh, registrations of uh, of refugees in Italy, uh, in the refugee camps, and uh, suddenly they don't find the refugees anymore. And uh, what we see on these documents is always uh, written AWOL, yeah? The refugees have disappeared and we know that they went to one of the illegal boats. So we are trying to collect information about the same Ma'apil from the JDC, JDC, you all know, yeah, the American Jewish uh, Joint Distribution and from the, you see, but we have to, to work with all these, here for instance, uh, who made all these lists, right? So there would be organizations who would make the lists like what we saw now, the JDC. So there would be American people sitting in the Cypress camps, for instance, Cypress camps, there were, operating between 1946 and 1949, February 49, 12 camps, 53,000 illegal immigrants that passed there in two and a half years. So the Americans would write sometimes in a different way than um, the 
illegals themselves who were on, a co on committees, different committees inside the camp, they had uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, jobs there as the committee. So if it would be a Romanian guy, he would write like a Romanian. If it would be a German, someone speaking German or Yiddish, not very much, but especially Romanian and German. These are the two ways that they would write their names. So we find here uh, an example. I just wanted to show you that we cannot use OCR in order to retrieve the information. We must type it on, onto Excel and from the Excel into our database. Okay, some of it is in Hebrew, some of it is in uh, uh, Latin. We have got um, a date of birth. Uh, this is probably a list of very old people, maybe for uh, old people's quota because you see they're all born, born in the 19th century. And um, I want to sh just share with you something, uh, um, you know, because we, call, we, we are called information center. You see, people give us information and others come to seek for information. And some years ago, uh, this is, by the way, a, a, a photo from uh, the Atlantic boat, this, the same boat that, um, Margaret Lazar was on. There were some friends We all had babies. And um, this baby here called Gidon, um, he gave us the, the picture, okay? And his mother who remembered the people wrote the names of the people here. And here she wrote, Hana was drowned during the disaster in Haifa port. And that's her baby, Rivka. Uh, and we hold this picture for uh, quite a lot of years because Gidon uh, was our friends from, from the very beginning. Some years ago, some woman came and she said, look, um, I know that I just found out, she was like 75 or so, found out that my father had a, a wife before and they had a baby and they were drowned in Haifa port and that I don't know their names and I don't know who they are and I don't have anything about them, I just found out. And we asked, what's your father's name? She said, Shalom Edelstein. Oh, of course, Shalom Edelstein. We know that picture. This is Hana, his wife. That's, his, that's your half-sister. And she was very, very, very moved because she only found out. And through our information, information center, she found that. So um, we've got, um, I just want to jump very quickly to our website and, um, oh, I see I have one moment. <laughs> Look, uh, I must apologize for two things. First of all, as we were building our website, it's not the website, it's the management um, co computer uh, system. Um, we, and we did it about 10 years ago. Um, we have at the moment, one main language which is Hebrew, although from the very beginning I knew that we had to do it, uh, you know, bilingual or even multilingual. So you see um, the headlines, they are all in English, so you can navigate through the headlines and so, but sometimes the information that you will find inside would be only in, in Hebrew. And this we have to take care of very soon. So more and more people who don't say, uh, speak Hebrew can uh, enjoy the website, okay? So that's one thing. Another thing is that we don't have enough staff to, um, you know, professional staff to translate the information that we have in Hebrew into English. So that's a little bit limited. What, what you will find, and this is a, a Google search, you will find around 136,000 listings of illegal immigrants and plenty, plenty, plenty of pictures. And here you can navigate. And because we do want to enlarge our, our, our English um, uh, visitors, so we do have some testimonies in English that we have uh, translated for the English speakers. And remember that it always go according to the illegal immigrant. Okay, so. For instance, I will just take this guy. Every time that it is blue, it means you can enter into the information or to the link. So um, 
you see here you have got the testimony in English of his uh, Moroccan who was one of the uh, boats who left uh, um, Algier, north, north of Africa. And the eye will send you to the state archive to see the list where he was taken from. Okay, so you can either navigate Let's go back to quick search so you will see the first page of our and you can explore. You can explore the boats with a lot of pictures. Every every item you go in, you will see you, we've got I don't know how many thousands of pictures, tens and hundreds of thousands of pictures or albums. Yeah, like photo albums uh, that you can find or you see here 55 photo albums, but each one of them can have like 20 pictures or so. And we've got many, many, many different albums in different uh, um, uh, searches. But here I can also search for, let's say, we already know Herbert Lazar. So I can search him. So you can search by name and you get him very easily also his mother because she's connected to him we tie the people together the families together so you can go from one to the other and you go to his boat Amapila Almuni right these are all the links and you can also go to advanced search this was easy search but when you have an advanced search you can just type in the I would type Herbert, never mind. And I choose, let's say, I've got a lot of fields. I want to choose his mother name, Margaret. So let's see what I will have. Okay. Now, one thing. Nothing. I didn't write it right. Uh, sorry. Uh, remember that uh, Moria uh, will, I mean, you will get our, our um, email address and please write to us in every search that you need help. Okay. Uh, because I know because of the language, sometimes it doesn't operate well, or if you didn't know exactly what to search, like Hamapila Almoni, which is in Hebrew, the name of the boat. So you try to, to translate it, but it's not written in the translation, but in, okay. So there could be some difficulties in finding the information that you are looking for. Um, so please write to us. I just go very short to show you the I. Now I will do something like that. I will write Arulsen. You remember I told you that we are retrieving information from Arulsen archives. So um, you see, Arulsen actually gave us the uh, um, permission to put their lists online. All their lists are in English, and that's why, because who made the lists, who written the lists, are the joint. And, the joint have passed it in the 40s, late 40s to the to Aulsen, and this is where you can find. So I take one, Bela Bechar, and uh, the truth is that we have not yet put all the Aulsen lists online, yeah, but we show you here that the reference is taken from. Um, the Alton archives uh, from this uh, uh, unit and from uh, this page. And no, that page is 71 and so on. Okay. And so you can see, well, I'm not sure you can see the list because I opened an extra uh, uh, window, but you can go here. You see the eye takes you to, should take you to the 
Well, 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 something I have to check. It should take you directly to the, uh, to the list, but maybe the link has changed. But let's say, see here, if I write Israel State Archive, I will have, I don't know, you see how many people, oh, thousands of people, okay? And I show you how you, you find the link to the state archive. How do I find the link to the state archive? Well, well, well. I don't give you a very good example. Rina, what if you click on one of the, uh, the names? The what? What if what if you click on one of the names in the uh, in the in the list of results? Yeah. Will that? Uh... No, I want to find one with the I. You know, the I is oh. the link, and okay. I. And instead, I find someone that uh, one that we did before the state archive was on the. <laughs> but now I'm feeling a little bit stressed, <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, I will write a uh, Margaret Lazar because I always I already have her in my head, and you will see this would be okay. So we come to her, and you see the eye. So the eye says here. It should be in English too, sorry. It says that you, if you press here, you will be uh, referred to uh, the state archive to page 276 because the, page, the state archive, which is only, not only, mainly in Hebrew, uh, but no, the, all the deportation, everything from the British is in English, of <coughs> course, and uh, you are, we also build links to that. So, now the state archive uh, file opens up, but these files are very big PDF, big PDF. So we remember that we need to go to page number 276. I hope some of you can uh, read Hebrew, but what you will find here once we go into that um, list would be the uh, uh, returning from Mauritius. They returned in, as I said, in August 1945, the 8th of August. Uh, on a boat called the uh, Franconia. So we will find the uh, list of Franconia. I think I opened it before, so it's here already. I jumped because it took a long time to open. You see five, 525 pages in that list. And I go to 276 if I press here. And here I am on the boat Franconia uh, from Mauritius. And the uh, Lazar would be, she should be here. Lazar Margareta, uh, she was 49. She goes to Joji Lazar, uh, Irguna Yogev, uh, in the area of Haifa, Mount Carmel, uh, Shoshana Street. So you see, uh, there's quite a lot of information. We learned that she must have had some relative here <coughs> called uh, Zhuzi or Zuzi. Yeah, and all this information we write down and we uh, write it also in some cases in English, not in all cases. Okay, sorry for that. We, That's by okay. the way, our staff is made of uh, two main people. It's me and Yael Kaufman. And we've got some helpers and volunteers. So, yeah. Okay. But as I said, we already have almost 140,000 listings in the 10 years that we are working. Good. So try us, navigate us a little bit. You will find a lot of nice things, especially if you go to the pictures. Um, to get there, you go here to the quick search. And now I'm ready for your answer for your questions. Okay. <laughs> they are. Can you please um, turn off your screen share first? Yes. 
So let's see. We have quite a lot of different questions. Uh, so, uh, okay. So one person asks, uh, where can you search for documents of the, <clears throat> the legal immigrants who came during the mandate? <laughs> the legal immigrants, they are all immigrants until today, even they are taken care by the uh, Jewish agency. Okay, so the Jewish agency at the time, uh, even the, the list that we just saw now, they are actually illegal immigrants. The, once they are getting permissions by the British to come back from Mauritius to Palestine, they are legal. And uh, they are being uh, accepted by the absorption uh, uh, department of the Jewish agency, who is preparing these lists. And all these lists are in the Central Zionist Archive. Uh, they are open up to 70 years. Uh, it means that um, 1952 would now be open. After that, you cannot see the lists. And uh, there was a joint uh, uh, project uh, sometimes in the early 80s between the State Archive and the National uh, and the Zionist Archive. And the State Archive has copied the lists and they have put them online. Okay, so you can search online up to between 1917 to 1952. Uh, if the person that is, has asked the question would like to help, uh, to get help, I can explain to him how to do it by email. It's, okay. But he must have a knowledge of Hebrew because it's all in Hebrew. Okay. okay, without Hebrew, it's, <laughs> it's not possible. Yeah. yeah, or to send a request to the Central Zionist Archive and uh, with a payment of 200 shekel, which is about, I don't know now, some dollars, and then um, they are doing the, the search for, for whoever okay. is looking. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's see. Does Atlit have lists of the immigrants who came from Iraq? Uh, legally in the early 1950s and went to Sha'ar Ha'aliyah? No, 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 no. Please remember, we are a database of illegal immigration. So, mm -hmm. and the illegal immigration during the mandate period, because the minute yeah. the mandate period is over, then everything is legal because it's the state of Israel. Right. The only thing that is a little bit uh, half clandestine is the, um, leaving, for instance, Lebanon in 1949, after the establishment of the state, uh, the borders were closed. So people were going on boats, leaving, let's say, uh, Tyre or Sidon or, and coming here illegally, but as they enter, they are legal immigrants. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is just the, the turning point before all the Arab uh, neighboring countries became uh, hostile and then illegal immigra uh, immigration was impossible mm -hmm. at all. But this happened until the 50s, early 50s, and that's it. Right. Yeah, so remember that we are clandestine, clandestine. illegal immigration. Yeah, and also just during the mandate period, yes. Of yeah. course, because afterwards. Of course, because afterwards it was legal. Um, yeah. uh, okay, let's see. Um, I'm trying to, this is from Ellen here. I'm trying to obtain more information on the SS Liesel, which landed yeah. in Haifa in June, 1939. Yeah. Um, my grandfather's brother was on that ship and articles in the newspapers and even his police papers indicate that he was deported, but he actually stayed in Palestine. No, no, the, the Liesel were not deported. Okay. Uh, Liesel, it's easy to, if she, she writes the name here, let's say last name, I don't know, Cohen, for instance. Uh, and here, Liesel, Immigration by or from? That's because uh, immigration by Liesel or immigration from Iraq. Yeah. Ah, okay. So we will write uh, Liesel. Uh, you see Liesel? And we've got all the, the lists here. 
all the list. And I think maybe also some more information. Or, I don't know why it happens to me. You, maybe I'm under stress while I have to present things. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> um, so Ellen, if you have any further questions, we will be uh, sharing um, Rena's email address very shortly. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, now I wrote in Hebrew, Levi, okay? So I got uh, all the levies on the lead, on the Lisa, Kita Levy, Walter Levy, the general. Lisa uh, is one of the transports that, uh, like I described, the one uh, that was of the Atlantic, you know, on the Danube, going to Romania, on Lisa. Yeah, they were mainly from Austria, the people, and old people. Okay, yeah. uh, a few people say, uh, ask about pre-mandate immigration. Uh, so the Ottoman period was- I, I can expand, I mean, I can say something in, okay. in general, but that's once again, not our subject. Our yeah. subject is- Yeah, I understand. British, because the, there's such a big difference, you see the, the Ottoman Empire or the Ottoman regime had no, no aspiration, no promises, no nothing to help the Jews build a home here, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, re irrelevant. So the aspirations of uh, making a state or making a home for the Jews only starts when the British start here. Mm -hmm. So that's why it is so important to for us to see that um, instead of allowing so many immigrants coming here and, ref and, 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 and rescuing Jews from Europe, uh, instead deporting them back to Europe and then maybe they perished in the Holocaust. So all of that story is completely different from the time of the Ottomans. Mm -hmm. The Ottomans, they were completely... It's, yeah, what, what exactly the question about Ottomans? Uh, uh, what, was there illegal, was immigration in that period, was there, uh, was there illegal uh, uh, immigrants? Yes, uh, yes and no. Look, the, uh, they, the Ottomans, as they were losing their strengths in the Middle East, they had, uh, it was uh, 1841 or so, there was a, uh, a revolt by Muhammad Ali from Egypt, and uh, then the Ottomans they needed to a lot of they made a lot of uh, um, a, what do you call it um, not arrangements but uh, talks with the European countries, and they have opened the the immigration for the Christians, mm -hmm. and so the Christian. Um, denomination came here and they got a lot of land. I don't know if you noticed, uh, if you look at the view, uh, the news uh, two or three days ago, uh, Joe Biden, he went to, to a meeting at the Augusta Victoria Hospital, right? Mm -hmm. So Augusta, Augusta Victoria, she's the wife, she used to be the wife of uh, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany and the, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Abdul Hamid, he gave him land as a present because the, the Ottomans, they needed the relationship with the West in order to keep Palestine for them, not just Palestine, but other places. So the land started to reopen, not to reopen, to open to uh, non-Muslims to enter. And so the Jews also came. I, I, met, I said before that my, the grandparents of my mother, they came here in the time of the Ottomans because mm -hmm. they were, they were uh, Austro-Hungarian <coughs> citizens and the Sultan, the Ottoman have allowed the Austro-Hungarians to immigrate. Now, another thing, the big, the big uh, first immigration that came from Romania. Romania was part of the Sultanate of the Ottoman Empire until 1878, I think, something like that. 
So there were still almost Romanian citizens, uh, like uh, uh, Ottoman <coughs> citizens, and for them it was very easy to come here because they were not. When Romania became uh, independent from the Ottomans, uh, the Jews did not become Romanians. They, mm -hmm. they stayed uh, stateless. So the Ottomans have allowed them to come. But we, <laughs> now we are not talking about illegal immigration. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's a different period. And towards the end of the 19th century, uh, Jews came here. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, they, according to the Ottoman law, they had to become, they, we say, lehit atmen, to become Ottoman. Unless you were German or Austro-Hungarian and so on, you could keep your passports. But for instance, 1915, the First World War, the Ottomans have uh, deported all the people from the West. Yeah, also my family was deported from here. So, yeah, let's go to another question. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't see you now. Where are you? Oh, okay. there you I'm, go. I'm here. Uh, are those who died in Mauritius yeah. still buried there? Or were they, were they brought to their... No, they they, no, there is a Jewish uh, cemetery in Mauritius. Mm -hmm. And um, Mauritius is close to South Africa. And uh, during the, the detention, uh, of 1,700 1, people, or almost 800 people, the um, community, the Jewish community of South Africa was taking care of the people that were sending them uh, parcels and food and rabbis. And, and um, they also buried them and they took care of the, the cemetery. And until mm -hmm. today they do. Oh, but okay. today, yeah, 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 it's the South African uh, uh, Jewish community. Uh, and also, uh, recently, there is a, a growing in, in interest by the people of Mauritius about their own history, and they also, there is a little museum there, and there are people from Mauritius who are writing and researching and uh, taking care of that. It's a very, very well-kept uh, uh, um, cemetery and I even I don't know if I can just find it here but I have the map of the the map that was drawn then at the time in the 40s of every grave with handwriting who oh, wow. died and who was buried there and the, the the strange thing is that there is a couple among the detainees that were called uh, Pincus, and I forgot his uh, his wife's name, Offenbach, like my name. Mm -hmm. And she died, and she's buried in Mauritius. And I always thought, well, I have to, to research once to see if Pincus Offenbach, who came, who returned from Mauritius by himself and left his wife buried there, if he's from my family or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it always pop up yeah you know this yeah so i think you can find it on billion graves you can see it you, you know billion graves right yes mm -hmm. you will see the cemetery oh okay all right so i'm gonna ask you one final question about searching the database um uh well actually it's two parts um does the name, uh, can you search the database in English? You, you, you yes. did, but is it gonna give you the same results as if you were, as if you searched in yes. Hebrew? Yes. yes, yeah, okay. Maybe maybe we can uh, have one name and, and I try and I hope I succeed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what, what is the name the that last, they- The last name is Rengavirts. Uh, R E I N G E R Rega R E I I N G E V I R T Z. Listen, a uh, it could be that the way if if the document was in Hebrew mm -hmm. and I have uh, transcribed it into latin letters maybe i didn't do it the way they yeah would write right. so this would be complicated now 
right. uh, to find because I already see that it doesn't give me any results close mm. to you see, Ah, in a regular, regular, in a Rhine Gewurz, Georg. Because my, my roots are German, I always write the way it should be. Like after the U, there should be an E also. Mm -hmm. Because it's Rhine Gewurz. Okay, uh, but never uh, mind. So I think I found it. So I, I recommend to write slowly, slowly. And yeah, maybe from maybe try different spelling variations, right? Yeah, but if you write it slowly, then the search engine already works and gives you the results before you write the way you think it's going to be. You see what oh. happened now? He gave me his results. And if I was going to write it the way I was thinking it should be, then it would not give me the results. But anyway, okay. I, the, the Georg Reingewurz, uh, can you share? Born. Can you share your screen? Yes, I think I can. Ah, you didn't see it at all. How I did it? <laughs> That's why. Can okay. you see now? Yeah, now we can see. Okay, there are some faults, and not everything is perfect. We are working all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Georg, uh, Reingewurz. He was on a boat called Kazbek. Kazbek is half legal, half illegal, because the, uh, the illegality of, of this boat is that they left Constanza in Romania without permission and they were sailing to Istanbul. And in Istanbul, the immigrants uh, got a, a group visa by the British uh, consulate in Istanbul and they could continue to Palestine with a train. Uh, once there was a train combined uh, connecting uh, the east with uh, Haifa along the shore. Uh, well, I will not tell you now everything yeah. about that train. Yeah, but uh, now they, it's, it's blocked. Now it's mm -hmm. not poss to po possible to go on that train, but they went from Istanbul to Atlit by train and oh. they arrived uh, yesterday, <laughs> 1944, <laughs> you see? Yeah. Uh, July 17th, the boat's name is uh, 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 Kazbek. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we took it from uh, two places, two references. One uh, state archive, which would be in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. It's not written here, but it's in Hebrew. And the uh, ITS, which is our Sen archive, which is in English. Okay. But it's not complete because we have not made the link to the state archive and not made the link to the ITS yet. Okay. But if someone well, at least writes to give somebody to us, an idea of where to look. Yeah. Yeah, but they can write to us and we will send them immediately the, the links. Okay. okay. So with that, <clears throat> on that note, can you please share uh, your email address? Sure. How will I do it? It's very easy, actually. Okay. Uh, athlete center athlete center is a t l i t c e n t e r at gmail.com i'm typing this into the chat now yes okay. okay so that's the best way for people to contact you right yep okay and we, for uh, everyone watching, uh, we shared the website uh, of this, of uh, Rina's uh, um, uh, information yeah. center. Yeah, in, information center, yes, exactly. And also where you can search the database of illegal immigrants. So with that, I'm going to conclude today's program. Uh, I wanna thank Rina again for um, putting together such a wonderful presentation and for demonstrating ser the search path, different search paths. Um, and thank you all for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Moria.